This week, we're going to take some time to discuss things that have caught our eye in the world of space flight over the last month. And I'll discuss my recent trip to Kennedy Space Center in Florida. What's caught your eye this last month? Let us know via our social media pages at Space and Things One on Twitter and at Space and Things Podcast on Instagram and Facebook, or via the contact form on our website. And please consider joining us over at patreon.com forward slash space and things. But right now, enjoy episode 147 of the Space and Things Podcast. Oh my God. Space and Things with Dave Giles and Emily Carney. I'm Emily Carney. And I'm Dave Giles. And how the devil are you, Emily? I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. Uh, had a good weekend. Uh, went to see Duran Duran. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, they're pretty good. Um, I don't know how these old guys, I, sh- I, I say old guys, they're in like their 60s, have more uh, stamina than I do, man. They put on a great show. So I had a fantastic time. So, and how are you doing? I'm good. They do put on a great show. I saw them at Kennedy Space Center in 2019. It was amazing. That's right. It was so, so good. It was really awesome. I had a great time. And Sheik was there as well with Nile Rodgers, which was oh, really awesome. Amazing. Yeah. Oh, that's, yeah. Yeah. That's very cool. All right. We've got loads to get through today. So, uh, how about we go around the room, make sure everyone's go? All right. All flight controllers, I need a go, no go for podcasting. Broadband, go. Computers, go. Microphones, we are go flat. Mixers, go. Enthusiasm, no flight. Awesome guests, we are go flight. Space and things with Dave Giles and Emily Carney is go. Right, first things first. As far as I'm aware, I may have this wrong, but there are two articles which you've released which I don't think we've discussed. First was a review about a new book from J.L. Pickering and John Bisney called Photographing America's First Astronaut. So tell us about it. Yeah, well, this book just came out recently. I think it came out in early May, if I'm not mistaken. It's really awesome. Uh, Pickering and Bisney have put out, I think, six other books, five or six other books with spaceflight photos. And these are not just, you know, these aren't photos you can find on the Internet. These are photos that you know, are are rare from archives, you know, from their archives. But this book focuses on uh, the Bill Taub, Taub, I think I'm saying his name right, collection. And Bill Taub was basically NASA's first photographer. And uh, he photographed a lot of the Mercury 7 during the first years of NASA when they first had astronauts and stuff like that. And it's really cool because if you look at a lot of photos from NASA nowadays, they're kind of staged. They're very posed. Absolutely. You have a sense that certain photos that are outtakes wouldn't just make it out there. Candids are not going to make it out, right? Yeah, we we don't see very many candids these days, do we? We really don't see many candids. That's a really good point. I'd not thought about that. Yeah, like you don't see candid NASA photos of the astronauts clowning around or all the time or something like that. You don't really see that. And I think it's just because times are different. I understand because NASA would probably get a lot of criticism. Like, why are these American heroes clowning around and you guys are paying, we're paying money for whatever. But this book is really cool because Bill Taub actually took a lot of candid photographs of the Mercury 7 that were, you know, very like unrehearsed. Very unposed. There's this wonderful photo, and I and I don't want to spoil the book too much for people who haven't seen it yet, because if you buy it, it's a real treasure. But there's like candid photos of Scott Carpenter like goofing around, you know, smoking a cigarette and stuff like that. And by the way, everybody smoked back then. So before you, like, I can't <laughs> believe he smoked. But um, it's incredible. Like there are so many photos in there that are just very almost casual. Like like it's almost like a family atmosphere. If you love the Mercury program and you love photos of astronauts, I, I highly recommend. I mean, I, I recommend, honestly, you get all the Pickering and Bisney books. They're all spectacular. They're all just full of photos you just cannot see anywhere else there. And these are, and I want to emphasize, these aren't photos you can find on, like, the NASA server. Th- these are rarities that you just can't see anywhere else. And it, it's well worth the purchase of getting it. And I think their previous book to this one They did a one about John F. Kennedy, sort of his presidency through the lens of, you know, the space age. 
and they did one about the shuttle program, the first kind of part of the shuttle program, the early shuttle program, which is really awesome as well. There's a lot of photos that I had never seen in my life that are just like, wow, this is really cool. So, yep, I give it five stars. Amazing. I reckon in about, well, maybe in 50 years, suddenly all the iPhone photos of the current crop of astronauts will start making their way out as we're celebrating the 50th anniversary of the build-up to the Artemis program and things like that. Let's let's hope we see some of those candid yeah. moments. Because those photos clearly exist, right? But currently we don't see them because they don't have a magazine deal or anything like that. And everything NASA puts out, as you said, is very staged. So uh, I'm, sure they, I'm sure they do exist, don't they? Anyway... I enjoyed that article, and there's another article that you've also done, uh, which is about the original plans for the space shuttle. Is is that fair summary? It's your your Space in the 70s vibe again, isn't it? Yeah, it it was kind of published under the banner of Space Flight in the 70s, and it was really about how the shuttle was viewed throughout that decade and sort of what people originally thought it was going to be. And as I kind of delved into research for this article, I found that there was kind of, there were, there were uh, strong viewpoints from both sides. The shuttle was not as popular as I thought it was oh, wow. during the 1970s. A lot of people sort of blamed it for the end of the moon landings, which is a fair point, I suppose, since NASA really did start putting all their, you know, money into it. So yeah. um, it, it's a fair point, I suppose. But um, also at the time, you know, a, a lot of the, astronauts the apollo astronauts from that era weren't into it didn't like Mm. the idea of it because of the the safety issues that we now know the shuttle had and also another thing some of the astronauts from that time i interviewed mike mullane you know and during the 70s he he knew about the shuttle basically through the pages of av week and he didn't really know until he got to nasa wow is this thing really going to be safe there's no ejection system Mm. Things like that. And also, I was looking at the space shuttle through the view of like what it was promised to be, because what it was promised to be and what it was was were, or what it became were two different things completely. They were saying, you know, oh, this thing's going to fly, you know, 500 times by the 90s. And we're going to have, you know, routine shuttle launches from both sides of the coast in Vandenberg and at Kennedy Space Center. And it's going to be as routine as flying on an airplane. Everybody's going to be able to fly on it, including you, including regular people. That's awfully ambitious. It's almost like what people are saying today about space tourism, in a way. I was just thinking exactly the same thing. But but then even that isn't that frequent, is it? No. Space tourism, of course, I think is just really getting started. I mean, now I think... Virgin uh, Galactic and I think Blue Origin are are finally starting to send paying customers to space pretty soon. But obviously, it's not without risk. Mm -hmm. So yeah, the space shuttle was basically sold as something that it really wasn't during the 70s. And I'm a space shuttle freak, you know, and I love the space shuttle. I grew up with it. And I was interested in looking at it through a different set of eyes that maybe I hadn't thought about. Because I didn't grow up, I was a baby in the 70s. I didn't grow up when they were really developing it. So I can't, I couldn't really say, you know, what people thought or didn't think about it. So yeah, I I wanted to look at it through what people thought about it as it was being put together. And um, it was kind of eye-opening, especially in light of the fact that it got delayed so much. And that, you know, they were saying, oh, it's going to fly by 1978. And yeah. Not even close. It was like three more years until it flew. It, it By the time it arrived at Kennedy Space Center in 1979, it was not remotely ready to fly yeah. in space. And I, I want to say they had to send it back to get, like, fixed, you know? It was really cool. I interviewed two of my heroes for the article. I interviewed Dennis Jenkins, and I interviewed Mike Mullane, Amazing. who we've had on the show a few times. Yeah. I want to get Dennis Jenkins on the show in the future. I know he's very busy at the moment, but I'm hoping within the next year or so, we can get them on this show. That would be amazing. Oh, yeah. I, I love that you've written this article and you've come at it from from uh, from that point of view. It also reminds me of the pre-show, which t- takes place at the Space Shuttle Atlantis exhibit at Kennedy Space Center, which is 10 years old this month. Can you believe that? Yes. Pretty crazy. And, and that is a good segue into my trip to Kennedy Space Center recently. So let, let's get into that, if that's all right with yes. you. Yes. Yeah, let's talk about that. I want to hear all about it. Yeah, so I, I mean, I went down there twice, and we did a whole episode, which I will, I will link about 
Kennedy Space Center before and um, what is there. Since then, there is a new exhibit, which is which is obviously very, very cool. That's the Gateway exhibit. So if you want to find out about what's at Kennedy Space Center, go and check out that episode. But for me on this time, I did a few things which I, I hadn't done my previous trip. So first of all, as I mentioned last week, my girlfriend and I came down a night earlier than we were booked to go there because it was supposed to be a launch and we had the proper florida experience of awesome is it going to happen is it not going to happen is it going to happen is it not going to happen and it was only because we had it booked had a, had a tour booked very early on the saturday that we, we looked at it it was supposed to go off at midnight this launch and we was like should we just go down there book a hotel and if it goes we get to see a launch if not we're in the right part of florida to go to our tour the next morning and it was so overcast all day. The wind was coming. The wind was crazy. And I was thinking, there's no way. There is no way this launches. And then 10 to, 10 to midnight, we get down to Titusville Space View Park, and suddenly some stars start appearing in the sky. And it's almost like they know what they're doing. <laughs> it's almost like all day when they hadn't cancelled the launch, like they knew there might be a 10 minute window yeah. when suddenly it might they come know. come off. I know it doesn't yeah. always pan out that way and sometimes they still have to cancel, but they, they knew there was a chance because the previous day they just cancelled it outright. You're completely correct. Like it is the weirdest thing. I've I've been to launches before where I'm like, there ain't no way this is going. There's no way it's too There's nasty no out. I mean, there's already like thunderstorms. I'm like, there's no way no one, no one's launching tonight. And then it clears up a little bit and then they launch. And I'm like, really? Like, wow. You know, and yeah, there's a little, you know, a gap in between the weather and they're like, okay, let's go. It's good enough. And I'm like, what? That's why you should, <laughs> I never trust myself anymore. I never trust my instincts. On Atlantis, the, the last shuttle launch, it was like that. I honestly was like, there's no way we're going today. It's too nasty out. Nope. It w there was like a, a like a tiny window, window and it went. And I'm like, really? <laughs> I mean, yeah. and I'm glad because I, I was about to leave and I was like, I'm glad I caught it before I just left. Wow. It'd be yeah. like that sometimes. <laughs> but it, it was quite a nice experience because there was there wasn't that many. It was midnight. Uh, and and the weather wasn't great, so I guess uh, that may have put some people off. But there was a row of cars in that area where people park up before the before the launch, and everyone was sitting in their cars. And literally at ten to midnight, even before we'd had to go for launch, everyone just started walking over. And and it was just a wonderful experience to be amongst other people who wanted to experience a launch and get to get to that point and see the the sky light up. So I had a great time, and then and then we woke up the next morning and obviously got to see it a lot of that area all up close. So so we spent some money. I posted a, a thing about the fact I did this tour and a few people thought I was getting a private tour and I wasn't. This is something anyone can do, but it isn't cheap, right? So we did the fly with an astronaut package tour, right? Which is basically there's an astronaut, they have about 30 or 40 people on a, however many fit on a, one of the tour buses basically. And you get to go and do a, a they call it a behind the scenes tour, but it, it's not that much different to the explore tour uh, that that happens. Other than you're with an astronaut, you also have lunch with the astronaut, which is pretty cool. Q and A, and then afterwards you do the shuttle exhibit, walked around with the astronaut as well. Which bear in mind, it, they're all shuttle astronauts. is very cool. And we we had Steve Smith, who is one of the guys who worked. I mentioned him last week. But he's one of the guys who worked on Hubble. Uh, he's, he's done the second most amount of spacewalks of any American. Uh, so he, he's a very cool guy and just so down to earth and lovely and very tall, which was quite surprising. Uh, he was nearly as tall as me. I noticed he was about as tall as you. And I was like, dang, I did not know there were any tall shuttle astronauts. I think yeah. maybe except one I knew about. But I was like, wow, there are actually uh, shuttle astronauts that are bigger than I am. Like, awesome. You know? Yeah. So <laughs> he, uh, obviously the shuttle had slightly different parameters than the previous spacecraft. But what's yeah. interesting is those spacesuits must have, been, they must have been quite tight for him because uh, they didn't have many big ones, did they? So bear in mind how much time he spent doing spacewalks and your spine stretches in space. That can't have been fun. But it, it was a great tour. Uh, Steve was amazing. I can't speak highly enough about this tour. It was worth every penny. I was with my girlfriend who has never been to Kennedy Space Center and you know she's not someone who's hugely into space. She's got into it through my love of it, but it's not her passion and she absolutely loved it. He was so engaging with people 
of all levels of experience and knowledge and age uh, of the space program. And that's no easy feat to be able to deliver a tour and answer questions for someone like me, who knows a lot of stuff, and to someone who's perhaps bought the ticket on a spec on speculation. Oh, I'm in Florida. Oh, you can do this thing with a national. Yeah, that sounds cool. So that was really amazing how, how well he did that. And the one thing that for me made the whole tour worthwhile beyond the fact that he was lovely and all this kind of stuff is that we got to see the door. Now I've said this to a few people. Oh yeah. Well, we got to go and see the door. And I'm like, what do you mean the door? I was like, for me, there is an iconic door at Kennedy space center, which I never thought I would see. I thought you know I'd have to be press or media or be an astronaut's family or something like this. And this is the door that they come out of when they go to do their mission, right? So they come out of crew quarters, all suited up. All the iconic photos of the astronauts walking out and getting on the on the astro van. I got to sit in that spot where they come out of the door. I didn't get to get outside the van at that point, but for me, just seeing that area now, knowing where that is in terms of the complex. Oh my God, I, I lost it. And I think everyone else on the bus was a bit confused as to why I was jumping up to take photos of this door. <laughs> and I was, Lucy was like, are you all right? And I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm just having a moment here. I'm just having a moment. It's the door. Uh, so That's I was really awesome. Ha- yeah, I was really happy about that. And then we went down to launch pads 39A and B, which are obviously the historic ones where all the Apollo missions, all the space shuttles launched from. So apart from Apollo 7, uh, a big deal, a really big deal. And to see them up close was amazing. And of course, 39A is now the home of SpaceX. They've got it on lease at the moment. 39B is where Artemis launched from last year. So they're still creating history and that's really cool. And SpaceX have done a really good job with 39A. They've made it iconic again for their own reasons, with their own unique way. And, you know, since Inspiration 4 and Bob and Doug and all those kind of missions, which I've been so invested in, to then see that black launch tower and the mobile launch arm, that was really cool. But also, right next to it, on the same complex, they are building a Starship launch tower. Uh, so seeing that next to it and seeing how big that thing is and getting the perspective of seeing that right there, obviously it's not finished yet and I'm sure they've got some lessons that they may have learned from from their previous launch in Boca Chica that they need to uh, figure out. But seeing that was pretty cool and also seeing the mobile launch platform for the, the space launch system for the Artemis program, seeing that up close and we drove right up past that, but it's currently parked up by the vehicle assembly building and seeing that up close and just remembering all the images from last year when that rocket got rolled out and obviously didn't see the new rocket, but seeing that launch platform was still really cool and seeing it up close. So uh, you get to do that on the Explore Tour as well. So don't feel like that that's not a thing, but the Explore Tour doesn't take you to the door. Doesn't get you to the door. So that was that was a day. Now that the, the astronaut experience thing is a full day. Like we, we once we finished it, we finished about two o'clock, and then obviously they put on a special coach for us to go over to the Saturn Five Center. And once you've done that properly, you're not really going to have time to to do much of the other stuff in the main center. So if you were interested in the the Hall of Fame or Gateway, you might not have time, or an IMAX show, you might not have time to do that if you do this expensive. App fly of a national thing but if you're there for a couple of days or you or you've not done it before i recommend it if you've got the money because just having that experience of having a national there talking you through and you know we're standing out by 39a and 39b and just saying asking him well where's the where's the guest house from here where's where's the famous obviously you can't see it from there but getting that perspective of where everything is and his stories about that and his stories about the letters that he wrote for his family and all those kind of things just was next level and to be there when when you're having that tour was so special so so special after that day lucy and i went to sorella's i've finally been to sorella's how'd you like it oh my god it's so much nicer than i just thought it was a bog standard italian restaurant it's so much more than that it is nice yeah it is very nice what'd you have what'd you have i had a steak that was on the specials it was awesome. amazing. So yeah, I, I treat myself to that. But I wish I'd had the pasta, but the, the specials just look so good. There isn't really a bad meal there. The waitress was telling us that everything's cooked fresh. Every single thing is it cooked is. fresh. Nothing's yep. put in a freezer or anything like that. Everything is made to order, which yeah. I love. Yeah, it's not um 
I don't want to call out any other. We have some chain Italian restaurants in the United States. Olive you Garden. Know, it, <laughs> yes, I didn't want to. I like. Hey, I'll eat me some Olive Garden occasionally. I love. Okay? I love an Olive Garden. I don't care. Those breadsticks are amazing. Yes, the soup and salad. I yes. will just inhale it. I don't care. I don't care if it's not. You know, whatever. But um, yeah, it's not Olive Garden. They do everything just fresh and made to order. It, it's really freaking good. I yeah, I love Zarellas. It's really delicious. So the those things are are. Free plug for Zarellas. <laughs> Free plug for Zarellas. Yeah. I got to go back there sometime. Yeah, I, I'm looking forward to going back as well. I, I, to have some of the pasta as well. I definitely next time need to have the pasta. Anyway, oh, I, then yeah. we, we had a second trip. I took my family also to Kennedy Space Center, which was also awesome. really nice. My mum, awesome. my dad, my brother, and my nephews. And we got the Explore Tour, which is considerably cheaper. Uh, and it takes you out to the launch pads, which the standard free bus tour doesn't go out to the launch pads. But that was really cool as well. And at the time, a rocket was on the pad 39A, which, was, which wasn't a few days earlier when I was with Lucy. So seeing, seeing a rocket, cool. which is about to go to the space station was so cool uh, and seeing that up close we got to go right up close to it and it was so epic it was like oh my god this is amazing um, so I, I remember doing a similar tour when I was a kid when I had a space shuttle on the pad but because they had like they had that uh, thing that I've never seen one on the pad well, well, well you could literally see the tiny top of the fuel tank because they had that big, but still that's pretty awesome yeah they had the big thing that would cover it up that would enable them to get, have access to all of all of the parts and all that kind of stuff whereas yeah. here you've just got the the rocket it's just there and it's just in all its glory, all, all shiny and well, a little bit sooty at the bottom because obviously it gets reused. So that was really cool. That's and amazing. We had a great, a great tour guide, Lee Wilson. I mentioned him last week. He's been on the podcast before. Yes, he has been on our show, and he was amazing. Again, really good at, at connecting with the kids and someone like my, me and everyone in between. It was really, really awesome. So we had a bit more time after that and saw the new Gateway exhibit, which I'd not previously seen. I loved it. It's really cool. Uh, finally, got to do the shuttle simulator as well which is worth doing i've never done that before so yeah great times at kennedy space center and uh similar to my experiences at houston if you if you're willing to pay the money and do the tours behind the scenes tours if you've got that money gems of the experiences you get at kennedy space center you know those uh those extra the bits for the real space buffs like us I, if you can afford it then then do it and certainly for me it's a real treat because obviously i don't get over there very often so i save up and make sure yeah. i can do it and and try and do those things yeah i really recommend those tours if you haven't if you if you don't get out there a lot if you get out there a yeah. lot okay whatever but if you if you're somebody who you know is just traveling to the area i i think honestly they're pretty um they're expensive but to me they're they're worth it it's almost like certain and I know you went there as well. It's like certain Disney experiences. Some of them are expensive, but it's like, this is the only time you're probably going to do it, you know? So absolutely, just do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it's, uh, you kind of have to have that mindset sometimes, don't you? That oh, We can pay for it later, <laughs> which is exactly. not, not sound financial advice. Do not come to me yeah. for financial advice. Yeah, but... me neither. Do not come to me to do your <laughs> invoicing or your bookkeeping or anything. But I think there are some things that are just like, this is going to be an experience. Like, this is something yeah. when... I don't want to think about a deathbed, but when there comes a time where, you know, hey, Emily, you got five minutes left, this is something you'll remember. You're going to be like, wow, that was a lot of fun. I'm glad I did that. Yeah. I don't know. I think about that now that I'm getting older. I think about that stuff like, man, that looks fun. I would love to do that. You know? Yeah, absolutely. You don't want to know it was there and you didn't do it. Exactly. Exactly. It, I feel the same way. Yep. That's how I am at the moment. So that's, uh, that's that's how it went. Anyway, a great time. Awesome. I know we said that this episode was about what caught our eye, but I just thought it'd be nice to have a little update about uh, <laughs> your articles. I mean, maybe you've got other things you want to talk about, but for me, I, I thought people might really enjoy hearing about my time on Kennedy Space Center. I wanted to hear about your trip because I'm like, it looked really awesome. And I like hearing about um, trips like that and experiences like that through people's eyes who maybe haven't seen them before. You know, yeah. because I feel from my perspective, I've been to Kennedy Space Center. I like Kennedy Space Center. I don't want to sound like, oh, yeah, I've been there. But you kind of get to the point where you're like, oh, I've been there before. Yeah, I've done I've done tours, whatever. And it's like, yeah, I feel like you need almost to have somebody who hasn't done it before 
who is looking at it through a pair of like fresh eyeballs that they're just seeing this, you know, and yeah. they're like, whoa. I mean, I still look at space flight like that, but I like hearing it from people who it's like they've seen it for the first time and they're excited about it for the first time. Which was why it was nice being with my exactly. family and with Lucy as well, because because it was yep. new, especially for Lucy. Everything was new. And my nephews, you, you know, they had, they had a great time and, and were awesome. asking all the right questions. And afterwards, we're, we're asking all the right questions. And we watched Apollo 13 be- around that time as well. So they, they could awesome. kind of ask and questions Fred about was that. on it. Absolutely, right? Yeah. Absolutely. And you could be like, oh, yeah, we talked to that guy. Yeah, exactly. Which is which is really cool. Well, it's quite something. Really. It's beyond cool. It's beyond yeah, cool. It's really awesome. Yeah. But what was interesting about doing the um the the fly with the astronaut tour again that whole seeing things through new eyes when it came to the expose of the shuttle Atlantis. You know that big big reveal. The yes. reveal. Uh, it still he makes lo- me cry. Absolutely okay? right. It still makes me ball like a baby. Yeah. I don't care. I can see it. A 10 million times and I'm going to be like, ah, at the end of it. So it doesn't matter. I did it twice in a week and both times, both times. But yeah. what was re- Each time there's always like tears. I'm like, oh God. It's so good. It's, I can't hype it up enough. I, I don't think there is a way of hyping it up enough. And uh, I mean, afterwards it was all everyone was talking about. Oh my God, that shuttle reveal. Amazing. And yep. um, Steve Smith when that was coming, when he knew it was coming, moved round in front of everyone, got his phone out and filmed everyone's reactions. He's seen it so many times and he's flown on the thing, but to him, seeing that joy and just amazement in people's eyes as we get that reveal, it, he said, you just, it never gets old. It never gets, and I just can't imagine it does ever get old. My one criticism uh, at the moment about Kennedy Space Center uh, in terms of what's there at the moment, let's not talk about a, a certain other thing, uh, which we mentioned a few weeks ago. But my one, uh, my one criticism is that perhaps the pre-show at the Saturn V Center needs updating. It's a little bit dated, and uh, they're still calling it the most powerful rocket. Like it just, I just feel it needs freshening up. It, it, it feels like it was made twenty years ago because it was made twenty years ago. Yeah, because it was made twenty years ago. You know, it's funny. I'm glad you mentioned that because I didn't think about that because I'll be honest, I haven't seen the show, the pre-show in a long time. You just I just walk, walk in, in right? normally and just hang out, you yeah. know, or whatever. So that's a good point. But it probably does need to be updated a, a bit. But it's hard because this sounds awful. <laughs> Not a lot of those guys are around now. You know, who are you going to update it with? Well, absolutely. You know? Yeah. Well, they, but they've updated bits around the rocket yeah. like they've got those great holograms that's I amazing like that. but the actual pre-show yeah the pre-show thing they've got that's the bit that it's a re- it's really cool what they've done there they're recreating the firing room and all that kind of stuff that's, that's so cool. cool the way the windows kind of yep. shake i love that that's such a great experience so cool. but it's the kind of the video parts of that need updating. I don't know how they do that as well as keeping it kind of current and and as you say including the people that that were there cuz they're now really old. Now maybe maybe you have to say we're not or you use archive footage of those people but That's true. They could use archival footage too, sort of like um what they did at Houston for the the historic firing room. The or the not the firing yeah, room. Mission control. Absolutely. I'm sorry. Not the firing room. Mission control. Absolutely. Maybe they could do something like that because they did that with almost pretty much all archival footage. You know, with a few, I think they inter, yeah. they inserted a few like um, demonstrations in there to look archival, if that makes sense. But they did it using old footage, which is really cool. And they just had a voiceover by Gene Kranz, which is, which worked great, you know. So, yeah, they could use, they could do something like that. And I'm sure there's plenty of people who would help them out with that. I mean, we, uh, we yeah. know plenty of Charlie. Charlie Duke still going. Fredo. Fredo still doing public appearances and public talks. Either one of them could read out a script really well and and make that make that work. And you still have that connection. Uh, but but yeah, it's just just a little bit dated. That's a, it's a minor criticism, but uh, it's a little bit dated. Whereas whereas everything else is looking amazing. And uh, when I was with my family, obviously uh, we went there when we were twenty five years ago or whatever it was. Yeah, 1996 probably was the last oh, wow. time we went. So you were a kid. Yeah, but we, my mum and my dad and my brother were like, 
can't believe how much more there is to do now. Like, yeah. To them, to them, oh, it was, yeah. used to be like a half a day's activity. You'd watch an IMAX. You'd have a look. You, yeah. You'd do this. Go and see the Saturn V. Come back. Have a little mooch around and Rocket Garden, and then you're gone. But now there's so much to do. They were even saying, "Oh, oh yeah, it's probably probably a two day activity." And and it probably yeah. is. It's just difficult when you're normally there to go. Well, most tourists are there to go to Disney World or Universal, and yeah, got all those toll roads in between. It's hard to to make well, a two day thing work out there. I think part of it was to. I think part of the reason why it's more developed now is because uh, that it used to be twenty twenty five years ago. Is they are next. They are pretty close to Disney, and and Disney is a huge draw, and they kind of wanted to keep the Disney visitors, if that makes sense. Absolutely. I, and I'm saying this is a I, I'm a Disney freak, so I love I love Disney and Kennedy Space Center, and I and I honestly think Kennedy Space Center is is comparable. I mean, really, the exhibits are. I, I think the exhibits are fantastic. I think the pricing for what you get to see is, is reasonable. I don't think it's Absolutely. bad. I, Disney. I'm not going to go there. I don't want to get on the outs with anybody at Disney World, but it could be expensive, you know, but they do have, if you're a Florida resident, they have special discounts and stuff like that, which defrays the cost somewhat if you live in Florida, which kind of stinks yeah, for yeah, people yeah. who are outside of the state. However, I think KSC sort of rose to that challenge because they knew they were right by one of the biggest spectacles on earth. And honestly, I think it's it's just as exciting you know in a lot of ways and i'm not just saying that as a space geek i'm saying that is like i don't know anybody who can go through it if you haven't seen atlantis already i don't want to spoil it too much but you can't that that reveal is just when i first saw that i was like holy you know and each time it just it gets you right in the feels it's just incredible to me it's just um i i love the way the shuttle is displayed it's just it's it's really beautiful it's a great testament to an amazing program I, I just love it. So, yeah, I think it's just as good as the Disney parks and things like that. And that's saying a lot because, you know, I'm a Disney holic. I could spend 13 hours on my feet at Epcot and then just, and I'd be fine. You know? Yeah, absolutely. I think that was the feedback we got from my family as well, which is which is really good. So, uh, awesome. yeah, double thumbs up from, from me and the awesome. family for Kennedy Space Center. Your membership powers our podcast. Please consider becoming a Patreon supporter. Okay, so Emily, let's get started on this part. What has caught your eye this month, this last month in space flight? So these are, I think, five or six things that caught my eye over the last few weeks. Some of these are recent. Some of these are not as recent. But um, I found an article that basically says long space flights uh, have affected astronaut brains, astronauts' brains. And it basically discussed uh, researchers have examined th- brain scans of 30 astronauts before and after space travel. They have discovered that the brain's ventricles grow signific- uh, significantly. I said ventricles, but I mangled significantly. Awesome. <laughs> and those who completed at least six-month missions, less than three years may not be enough time for the ventricles to co- recover completely. Um, so that is crazy to me. I had no idea that was even remotely a thing. Um, the article, it doesn't really give any long-term implications. Like, what's that going to do to them in, you know, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years? So that's definitely something I'm hoping researchers keep an eye on for future generations because who knows how that'll affect people who are going to go to deep space or Mars or mm. the moon for extended periods. You know, if we get this lunar gateway thing, People are going to probably be at the moon for an extended period. And how, you know, is that going to affect them? You know, so that's something I definitely have my eye on uh, this month. And I also found another article basically that caught my eye and it discusses should all future Mars crews be all female? I saw this too. And yeah. And basically, the idea behind this is that women seem to be better suited to space exploration physically and mentally, I guess. And, you know, NASA's not horribly against the idea, but at the same time, they want to promote diversity in their crews, you know, through gender and and race, all that, all that, which I totally get. But that's kind of an idea that is being, you know, floated around that, you know, maybe in scientific studies, you know, maybe it would be better if we had all women crews because they might perform better. 
that's something that I think is worth investigating. I mean, we've never had, to my knowledge, an all-female space mission. Which is crazy. We've never had one. There's never been one. I mean, obviously, there have been all men space missions, but there have never been just all women in space. We've had multiple women in space at the same time, but there's never been a crew with just all women. And I've honestly been very curious, okay, how would that work? I'm sure if I put that on hipsters, there'd be a lot of nasty jokes about it and stuff like that. But it might work out well. You know, who knows? Everybody might adapt very well to it. It'd be neat to find out. So that's something that I'm definitely uh, was looking at. I'll keep this one very short. ULA uh, did a successful test firing, a flight readiness uh, firing of their Vulcan Centaur rocket on June 7th. Is that the one with the Blue Origin engines? Correct. Yep. And this is what their Twitter said uh, at engine start sequence. Begin at T minus 44.88 seconds. The engines throttled up to the target level for two seconds and then powered down. So far, it looks like those tests were at least it ran successfully and they're just gathering data from it to uh, see how well it went. So and if everything goes to plan, hopefully we'll see the first launch of the Vulcan Centaur, uh, I think, in the third quarter of this year. So fingers crossed. I can't wait to see that thing go. That's going to be freaking awesome. And I Mm -hmm. definitely plan on being there to see that. I I plan on being uh, on site to see that because that's going to be freaking amazing. I can't wait. Also, ULA, I believe, is launching a Delta IV Heavy. By the time this show comes out, that uh, will already be hopefully launched. If not, then it will have undergone a couple scrubs, maybe. Who knows? But hopefully that will be off by the time. This show is uh, live. There's not going to be many more of them, or is this the last one? No. I don't think this is the last one, but I want to say... they're coming to the end. They're coming to the end of that program. I think because hopefully other rockets will be able to take over for it. But it's kind of sad because I love the Delta IV Heavy. It's so weird. It's so beautiful, isn't it? (laughs) It looks like it's from space. Like, it doesn't look like it. Yeah, I've seen a few of those launches, and it looks just, like, otherworldly to me because it's such a weird launch vehicle like when you see something blow it not blow itself up but when you watch them and it lights itself up on the pad you're like oh my god and then you're like okay it worked it worked but yeah definitely is a strange launch vehicle i love it so i have a couple more things isa has proposed uh that marcus want i'm probably not saying his name correctly from sweden is going to fly on a future axiom space mission He was uh, selected as a member of the Astronaut Reserve in November 2022. And I guess they're working uh, together to... uh, Pushing him around quick, aren't they? Yeah, and I think it's kind of neat because according to the press release, if I'm reading it correctly, he's a member of the Reserve. He's not a full astronaut. He's a member of the Reserve Astronaut Corps, which I think is really neat. I'm guessing probably the Swedish government had something to do with that. They probably pushed for that financially, which is awesome. Sweden has flown a few people in space, to my knowledge. I know they've had at least one astronaut before. So that'll be that'll be really neat to see. So and I believe the Axiom flight he would be on would probably be in 2024. I'm thinking I don't think it's this year. Pretty cool, though. That is really cool. Another thing is on October 7th, Eileen Collins will be in Tucson, Arizona with Nova Space next door to the event center at Nova Space to hold a public book signing. But really, so far, not a lot of information has been uh, released about this event, but as soon as I get some more information, uh, we'll definitely put it on this podcast. But Nova Spaces, of course, are the people who did Space Fest for so many years, and we love them. Uh, we've had Kelsey on this show in the past before, and we, we love her friends at Nova Space. So um, as soon as I find out more about this event, I will promote it even more. And yeah, and the way Nova Space normally work is even if you can't make the event, you can send, you can normally, yes. I'm assuming this will be the same here, you can normally have things sent. Uh, if you like something signed by Eileen, it's a good way of being able to to make that happen if you can't get to an event that she's going to be at personally. Yeah, and Eileen's um, cool. So, that's, so she, of course, she's been on our show before too. So I feel like we're just bragging we're just bragging here, like, you know, they've been on our show before, as one does. It blows my mind. It blows my it mind does. when I think about things like that. It's like, what? How did we do that? Which is amazing. It's so cool. It's and so cool. I have one more story uh, that caught my eye Go. this week. This is the last one. It's about 
Beetlejuice, uh, the bright red star in constellation, or not the not the movie Beetlejuice, but um, uh. no, it's the star in the constellation, not the ghost or whatever. Beetlejuice, the bright red star in Orion constellation, um, has been acting kind of funky for the last few years, and some uh, astronomers honestly think that it's going to explode or supernova at some point soon. And um, this article here from Inverse if, says, if Beetlejuice goes supernova, Earth will have neutrino rain. And um, thankfully, neutrinos, I believe, are harmless. But uh, the other interesting thing is this will be in a, a, like a once-in-a-generation type event because um, I believe it'll be as bright as the moon. Wow. Yes, it'll be like we will be able to see this with our visible eye. This isn't something that we won't be able to see. We'll be able to see it with our eyeballs. So um, part of me is like, should I be pulling for this thing to explode or not? <laughs> part of me is scared because I'm like, you don't want to, you know, it's post pandemic. I don't like asking for anything crazy to happen anymore because I'm like, I just. The real scary thing is it's already happened. If it's happened, it's already happened many years ago. You have ago. a point. <laughs> Damn it. There's no stopping it. Uh, <laughs> never mind. Correction. Uh, Beetlejuice probably already exploded. We just haven't seen it yet. So we're just waiting on the... We're just waiting on it. So, oh my God. You have a point. Yeah. Holy crap. So yeah, when it does become visible here, it will be... <laughs> when it, It'll be as bright as like the moon, I think. That's, That's what so the article cool. states. I can't wait for that. So, That's going to be amazing. If that were to happen, that would probably be like a once in a, like, you know, uh, I'm trying to think of a comparable event. Like, um, Haley's co- comets every 80 years, isn't it? I suppose it's something yeah. similar to that, right? Something like that. Or like, um, God, there was a solar storm and like, this is way more extreme, but like in the 1800s, there was a solar storm that was so crazy that it was like, you know, it destroyed telegraph booths and stuff like that. That there's a wow. really cool book I have about it. Of course, I've forgotten what the name of the book was, but um, I read about it a few months ago. And I, I think it was called The uh, Carrington Event. I, I, I don't know about that. I need to look that up. Yeah, it was basically the solar storm that was like the perfect solar storm in the 1800s. And it blew out a lot of like the communication they had at the time, which was kind of rudimentary compared to what we have now. And thankfully, that's a once in a lifetime, like that's a once in a generation thing like that. Hopefully, I say hopefully because I don't want to jinx nothing and we wake up tomorrow and, you know, everything's crazy. Um, Yeah, hopefully we won't get something like that again. But this will be hopefully not as disruptive of an event, but kind of if it were to happen, this would be like something, you know, people would talk about forever, you know, because yeah. it would be visible with your eyeballs. So. So yeah, that those are the stories that have caught my eye this week. So in your neck of the woods or otherwise, what has caught your eye uh, in spaceflight? Yeah, I'm pr- I'm going to round up some things that people really already know about, but maybe not. So uh, again, with everything that Emily's mentioned and everything that I mentioned, there'll be links to articles in the show notes if you want to read up more about these things. If we if you don't feel like we've we're explaining it well enough. We're generally going to provide you with a link that will have a full article. Now, this the first thing that I want to bring up is uh, something we spoke about when we used to do the news. This is something that came up again and again because there was that whole drama about what lunar lander NASA was going to hire. And they, they'd asked three companies to put a proposal. Then they ditched two and just kept with, Star, uh, with Starship from SpaceX. And then Blue Origin and Dynetics sued NASA. And it was all a big drama. And, well... Blue Origin resubmit after much protest or whatever's happened have, have now been chosen to have another go. And the thing is, it's not with the same proposal they did before. They went away. And I'd like to thank James Franklin to send, for sending me an article about this on Facebook. Um, they went away and they went, right, well, clearly our thing wasn't right. And they've done their own completely reusable uh, lander, which will then live in orbit around the moon and so on and so forth. And it's just really cool that 20 years ago, no one was ever talking about completely re- reusable spacecraft. And now we are. And it opens up a whole can of worms of how do you refuel them? How do you store fuels in space, in depots, in space depots for fuels? Where's the gas station in, in space, basically? Uh, and and how will that all work? And I find that really interesting 
because it's completely unknown still. But that's what we're working towards. So I think there's going to be a lot of development towards this. Obviously, it's still taking longer than predicted. And an announcement yeah. also got made uh, over the last couple of weeks that the Starship's delays are going to put the Artemis landings back by at least a year from the current schedule. But surprise, surprise, we all thought that was going to happen anyway. Um, so yeah. yeah, I find this really interesting. So again, there's a, an article written by Eric Berger, who I'm going to, which I'm going to put in the show notes because I, th- I think it's really interesting. And yeah, it's great to see that B- Blue Origin didn't take it for, as a, or didn't just say, oh, but we sh- we deserve to have a have a go at this. Instead, they went away, redesigned something more to what they thought NASA actually wanted, and resubmitted their bid and went, look, actually, we think we we think this is what you want. We've we've taken your comments on board, and here's another go at it. I like that. I like that approach. I like that that, that that's what this whole Space 2.0 NASA working with commercial companies is doing. It's making these companies think outside the box. And I think that's great. While we're talking about private companies, Virgin Orbit is now completely gone. They sold off all their big assets, yep. including the, the, the big 747, which was capable of sending these rockets into space. But on the flip side, Virgin Galactic had their first launch since their launch that took Richard Branson up. And they had eight people going yep. to suborbital space uh, just a couple of weeks ago now. And as we mentioned, it looks like they're going to start ramping up. Uh, that schedule of actually having paying customers on board. Yeah. So it's great to see them back in action, despite the fact Virgin Orbit's not gone so well. Virgin Galactic does seem to have got through its problems, which is really cool to see. Which is amazing. Um, yep. it, it's great. It's great to have a positive story on, in that regard, and hopefully uh, that's that's cool. Also, the Axiom mission, we've hardly spoken about the Axiom mission, but they that went to space, Axiom 2 went to space, come back again, took th- uh, three new people to space, and Peggy Whitson got, got a round trip and she's coming back saying I can't wait to go again and I love that so that was really cool and all during that time we had a new record for the most people in earth orbit at the same time it got to 17 at one point because there was a a crew change on the Chinese space station at the same time Um, so that was pretty cool that you had that many people in space at the same time yeah 17 doesn't seem like many to me that's a lot yeah it also was the, the Axiom crew, uh, Axiom Two, took the 600th person into Earth orbit, which is pretty cool. So for 17 yeah. for them to be at the same time when we've been doing this for 60 years is uh, is quite cool. Yeah, that's a big accomplishment. On the flip side, a negative story about this commercial stuff is that Boeing have delayed the launch of the Starliner uh, spacecraft. Uh, which was due to take two astronauts into space this month. Well, it's been delayed a few yeah. times, but they've put it back again this time because they've found an issue with the parachute. Now, personally, I'm quite happy they've found that problem, but they've they've uh, decided to postpone indefinitely, which is pretty crazy because it looked like it was cl- yeah. it was close to be going, uh, and you had two astronauts about yeah. to get on board that thing. The, when I heard the parachute, I was like, "Uh, that scares the hell out of me, man." I'm sorry, like I don't know that. I'm like you said. I'm glad they found an issue with the parachute because if if they hadn't or if they just glossed over it, I mean, can you can you imagine? You know, I mean, yeah, that's not good. That's not good. Oh my god! At least they yeah. found it. Absolutely. Yeah. So other other things. There's loads of other things that have happened, and I might just put a whole load of other links that I think are interesting also in the show notes of stories. SpaceX had their two hundred. 200th booster landing, uh, the first wow. stage booster of the Falcon 9, which uh, it doesn't seem that long ago since it happened no. for the first time and they got that right. So, And the sad thing is, I, I, I'm sorry to interrupt you, it seems, I don't want, I hate saying this word, it seems routine. Yeah. They make it look easy. It's not easy, but... Yeah, from being in Florida for two weeks, that was the crazy thing. I think there was three launches of that space rocket and one in, in Vandenberg at the same time. They're doing yep. it with such a high frequency now. It really is becoming routine. Not not with crews, but that rocket is going up and they haven't had any problems touch wood for a long time with it. They're really, really, as you say, yeah. making it look very easy. I, it's just unbelievable to me. Like, I remember the first one that came down and I was like, oh, man, you know, that's really neat. And I don't think it really hit me at the time what that meant, you know, what that meant. And now look at what's going on. I mean, it's just, it seems like, they're launching one every other day, it seems. It's just crazy. 
Yeah, yeah we just absolutely. had one yesterday, I think. It's hard to keep up. Going back to our Kennedy Space Center to, to chat, it's great that so many people visit that site, get to see rockets on the launch pad and rockets launch because the chances of you seeing a launch now when you go out there are so high because they're so frequent. Uh, and again, when you then see the the Starship yeah. launch pad nearly built and you think, God, that thing's supposed to fly three times a day. If they get anywhere near that, it's going to be quite a, a loud place to live. Yeah, it is. <laughs> Oh my God, yeah, it's going to be crazier than it already is. That's the cool thing, is even when um I went down last August to see Artemis, the first Artemis attempt, obviously Artemis didn't go that day, which is fine. I'm okay with it. It eventually went perfectly, so hey, that's fine with me. But um, I still got to see a SpaceX launch that week from the Cape. So it was like, yeah. oh, okay, but you still got a Constellation launch. That's not, you know, that's really cool. There's enough going on there where you're not going to miss a lot. So it's really cool. Absolutely. So uh, there's been a lot of cool planetary science stories come out as well, and and especially in terms of missions upcoming. Uh, For example, all the instruments on the JUICE mission, which we previewed just before it launched uh, late last year or earlier this year, have now been proven to be operational, which is great as it's making its way over to Jupiter. Europe's Bepi Colombo spacecraft is to zoom within 150 miles of Mercury in a close flyby today as we're recording. Again, very cool. There's lots of these things are going on and yeah. I'm going to put some uh, put some links in the show notes about some of those things. One thing that I've been telling people about for ages, when we're talking about space and why it's important, and I always say it's going to solve our energy crisis. And the way I explain it to them is that we're going to be able to farm solar energy either in big space stations or maybe on the moon or something like that and beam the energy back to Earth. Well, I was aware that the technology existed, but it hadn't actually ever been done. But scientists have finally beamed solar power to Earth from space for the first time ever. So that has got so much potential to completely revolutionize our planet. When you think about emissions and all that kind of stuff, if we now don't ever have to rely on fossil fuels being burned, we can just rely on solar energy from space. Oh my God, that's a game changer. Obviously, we're a long way from having the, the infrastructure in place for that to take over. But... In theory, it works, which is great. Also, yeah. did you know that there's a... And we got, we're jumping all over the place here. There's a Carl Sagan film coming out called Voyages. I did not know. Voyages? Voyages. Voyage, voyages. Voyages. Okay, cool. I was not... Voyagers. I was not aware of this. No. Yep. And Andrew Garfield is going to uh, play Carl Sagan. What? Oh, my God. Sorry. I, sorry, Smokey. I woke up my cat. Um <laughs> Wow. Okay. I want to see this. This sounds really yeah. neat. We need to see more movies about cool stuff like that. That sounds like it's right up my alley because it's probably going to take place during the 70s or before. Yeah, That's going to be really cool. Yeah, you're going to want to write every article about it going, which is great. Yes, I can't uh, wait. Yeah. And finally, Japan has a wild idea to launch a satellite made of wood in 2024. And what? I'm not going to give any details because I've not even read the article. I just saw the headline and thought it was a great play- way to end this segment. <laughs> <laughs> I got to read. Okay, I'll look up more about it. Wow. Yeah, wooden satellite. I can't. I, mean, I can't believe it's ch- not been done. They're going to launch a chest of drawers, like an Ikea chest of drawers oh my in the God. space. That would be amazing. Well, maybe that's why Sweden have paid for an astronaut to uh, go into space. Maybe it's all connected. Yeah, they would have to build the chest of drawers first, though. That might take a while. So, <laughs> Take a flat pack kit into, into the yeah. space station. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Amazing. Oh, my goodness. Streaming from Earth's northern hemisphere to the solar system and beyond, you are listening to the Space and Things podcast. Thanks for joining us this week. I'm never sure how well these kinds of episodes, which don't have a central theme, go down. We have jumped all over the place, but I felt it was important for us to do that this week. Uh, we'll be back next week with plenty more space and things. A big shout out to Misty Delport, our Patreon subscriber who won this month's book draw. I'll be sending you a brand new space book ASAP. I haven't, I haven't decided which one it is yet, but this is something that we're doing every month for those who have subscribed to our Patreon page. And the more people that join, the more prizes we can add. So if you'd like to help us out, please head over to patreon.com forward slash space and things. And a big thanks to those who continue to share our podcast with your friends and family. It seems that quite a few of you really enjoyed our chat with Francis French last week Mm -hmm. about Sally Ride. 
We did too. And of course, don't forget, in space, no one can hear you mean.